Well, good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Ryan Wiley. Uh, just by way of introduction, okay, in fact, I, I haven't actually met everyone on the panel yet, so this is important. Uh, I'm the um, president of a company called Shift Health, which some of you may know is a strategy firm that focuses on the life sciences. But I'm also no stranger to McMaster University. I did my doctoral studies here in, the in immunology in the Department of Pathology and Molecular Medicine a few years ago, uh, and am also adjunct faculty in, in that department. But more importantly, uh, I have had the privilege uh, over the past couple of years of working with leadership across this campus uh, to help crystallize the vision for the global next, Canada's global nexus for pandemics and biological threats. And I just want to say how uh, thrilling it is to see how the nexus in a very short period of time has begun to pull together a very diverse cross section of disciplines and faculties and perspectives around some of the greatest challenges that we face. Nexus literally means connection. That's what the purpose of the nexus is, is to bring, is to make those connections that are so essential to tackling some very, very complex challenges, uh, including uh, AMR. And today we've heard four truly inspiring and thought-provoking talks that have both exposed the complexity of AMR from diverse perspectives, but have also begun to draw together many of the connections that we need to make in order to tackle uh, AMR globally as a, as a planetary challenge and, uh, and, and a mortal threat to all of us. So today, I, in this discussion, I, I want to see if we can make some more connections uh, and, uh, and m uh, new insights. I have some questions uh, for the panel, uh, but I really would welcome uh, questions from the audience today. So if you have a question, just raise your hand, stand up, uh, shout, whatever gets my attention. Uh, there are some microphones that are circulating, I think, and we can just bring those to you. So at any point, please uh, bring your questions, uh, your questions to us. But I want to start um, uh, by sort of drawing out, a, I think, a common theme in all of the talks today which is that the, the approach to collaboration globally and sort of the, the model of innovation, the business model and, and, and more broadly the innovation model, fundamentally need to, to change uh, if we are going to be able to develop new antibiotics, ensure that they're accessible, but more broadly develop uh, the, the broader suite of solutions that will be needed to tackle AMR. We've just gone through um, a global pandemic. We are still in it, although we're in denial now. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot happened, has happened over the past couple of years in terms of changing models or accelerating them in terms of regulatory standards or regulatory approaches, global collaboration, procurement, public-private partnership and innovation. We've shown that a lot can happen very, very quickly if there's will. I'd like you to think about what we've learned over the past couple of years and are there lessons that we can apply uh, to AMR uh, or, or is there an opportunity to sort of accelerate this based on the experience of the past couple of years? And any one of you, please uh, uh, contribute. I think uh, it wasn't Will that, that got the vaccine. It was the fact that we had vaccine platforms almost ready to go. Um, we still don't have, you know, a suite of COVID therapeutics, and so uh, what what we need to have Will for is to is to be prepared for things with platforms that are almost ready, ready to go. Um, what we uh, didn't learn was uh, anything about solidarity and anything about science communication. We have a lot of uh, lessons to unlearn about those topics. So I think we, we talk about COVID-19 and antibiotic resistance in, and compare them quite a lot. And so I just wanna point out two aspects because I think COVID-19 vaccines are not market failures. They're making a lot of money on COVID-19 vaccines and they are interchangeable. 
Um, so, you know, I can get a Pfizer vaccine, and I, 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 in fact, I have a Pfizer vaccine, and I have a Moderna vaccine. So we can, we can change those. And those aren't the case with antibiotics. Antibiotics are not interchangeable. You can't take uh, phenoxymethyl penicillin um, instead of meropenem. Or the, and so these are, uh, I think we've seen, especially I've seen the, from the European Commission, this desire to um, you know, think, okay, we've done it with COVID-19, so we can do it with, with antibiotics. But I think we really need to look at the distinctions between the two, because antibiotics, um, we need to, to look at them within the context of where they are. And we know that individual, the, it's creating new uh, uh, antibiotics, it is a market failure, and we need to address those uh, complex areas. So, um, and, and I'm a little bit also, uh, when we talk about the, you know, the silent pandemic of antibiotic resistance, we, we need to start talking about which antibiotics are, are failing and why, and let's get specific in what we need to do there. So, yeah. And then I would pick up on uh, Kevin's point on communication. Uh, you know, COVID vaccine, as a, as a scientist, I mean, what we have been able to do it makes me incredibly proud. Uh, but the fact that we still have to convince people to get vaccinated, we're failing somewhere, right? Uh, there's evidence after evidence of mortality. You look at morbidity, and we still are not able to convince people. And it's complicated. It's not as simple as somebody's being anti-vaxxer. Uh, there are communities, I mean, First Nation communities, uh, vaccine uptake has been low and for various reasons and reasons that are to a large extent justifiable. So communication, I think if we have to deal with AMR, uh, this has to be a major, major part of that. So I think there, there are two uh, thoughts that I have. First one is, I don't know how much uh, uh, humility we have really developed amongst ourselves. Um, so there are plenty of countries uh, which are uh, not as rich as the United States or United Kingdom uh, that did much better, right? So assuming that uh, being powerful economically automatically means you will get it right, I think is, uh, I, I hope that we'll realize that good ideas, good approaches, good policies can come from anywhere. And nobody, regardless of their economic power, has a monopoly on that. So a sense of humility is the first one. And the second one, I think, is the importance of things beyond science. So Kevin talked about social sciences. Um, the, the outgoing head of NIH, Francis Collins, in a, in a public television interview, was asked, what would you have done differently? And he said, I wish I knew more about behavior, right? So, so uh, here's somebody who's sitting on billions of dollars of research, outstanding uh, facilities, and he says his great regret is the fact that we have not engaged in understanding humans and their behavior. So I think if you really want to address issues of AMR, we have to understand that this is not just purely a science or an engineering issue. There are elements of human behavior, of economics, of, of development of certain kinds of attitudes that are there that we have to understand and appreciate. And going back to Ayusha's point, people have reasons to be skeptical. People have reasons to be uh, to, to not trust, and we have to really understand those and work with that rather than trying to come in with a heavy-handed approach. You've all mentioned or alluded to the, the importance of public engagement, public communication uh, in, uh, in, in addressing AMR, recognizing the emergency that it is. Uh, arguably, uh, it hasn't really registered with a vast majority of the population. Uh, like climate change, uh, for example. Certainly some policymakers recognize the challenge and are, are taking steps, but the public isn't necessarily behind it. What, what, what do we need to do to make this the public emergency it is? Well, I can say that in Norway, actually antibiotic resistance is something that politicians talk about. And it's actually, it comes up in the elections. Um, mm. Uh, oddly enough, uh, so I don't know if that means we have too few problems, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but uh, this is something that, that they are worried about. Um, in Sweden, it's actually gotten to the point where um, some patients are, you know, no, I don't want an antibiotic because uh, 
I, I don't want resistance, I don't want to further that, when they actually should be taking an antibiotic. Um, so uh, I think it's, you know, the continuing communication, but I think it's, it's very complicated, right? And when we talk about AMR and people don't really understand what does that mean, is that me, is that the bug, is that, there's a, there's a lot of things that um, I think um, Welcome Trust has done some very good um, research on how to communicate effectively about an antimicrobial resistance um, and what terminology you should use and what not. And so I'm not sure if we've done a good job of that today, but we have a, it's from Kevin's poll, it looks like most of you are, are scientists here, so there's some uh, quite a bit of understanding. So I think really having um, very simple messages um, but don't take it too far so that, you know, they get, the patients become afraid because if your doctor gives you a prescription for an antibiotic, you should take it. So uh, I, I agree with Christine, but to a certain extent, I, I grew up in Pakistan. I worked with the government. It's nowhere on the radar. It's a country of 220 million. And it's not that people don't care about their health. There are a whole bunch of other challenges that have the sense of immediacy. Um, so how do you really sort of work with that, right? So you have large countries, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. I mean, in that region you have, and if you are China, you have a third or a fourth of the world population. I don't know about China. I, I certainly don't know as much about India, but in, I know in Pakistan and in Bangladesh, it's not on the radar. And part of it has to do with sort of really communication and understanding. Uh, part of it has to do with language. Part of it has to do with challenges that people face on a day-to-day -day basis, right? I mean, this is... As, 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 as many people would say, this is something that is one more on a long list of daily grind that people have to go through. So how do you really engage in that? I think, again, goes back to my earlier point, is to really think about it from a, from a multidisciplinary perspective of, of how do people engage with that, not generating another sense of fear, especially after pandemic. There's a tremendous fatigue about that, but really engaging them to make good decisions, and everybody needs to be involved, the pharmacists, the doctors, the local community health workers, and the patients. And I don't think we have really reached that point. There's also the context there, right? So what may work in Norway may not work in Thailand. What may work in Thailand certainly would not work in another country. And, and so engaging with local people rather than have it a top-down thing that is out of context, I think, wouldn't really yield the benefits that we, we hope it does. To say on a hopeful note, the co-chair of the Global Leaders Group on AMR is the Prime Minister of Bangladesh. Uh, so, you know, even though it doesn't have the resonance that we get in Norway, uh, and I think we, you know, there's a lot for us to learn in this space. You know, I think, um, you know, I almost wish that uh, we were engaged in India with, with Bollywood or, or, or people that know how to do mass communications, which is not me. Yeah, yeah and I, I think the importance of context, understanding context is so important. And, you know, the South Asian uh, subcontinent region, Europe, quarter of the world population, you you know, you hear about that data, well, largest producer of colistin, uh, China, largest consumer of colistin, India, where is that all going? And then you see anecdotal stories about bags of ciprofloxacin being fed to chicken. Um, and uh, I remember actually one of uh, Jerry's talks from maybe 15 years ago, he would show a flight map, planes flying around the world. Uh, and uh, And if you think about you know, one person in one of those flights just moving around within 24 hours. So, uh, so the problem is global, but but the solution has to uh, take context into account. Really important points. Uh, I just want to turn to the audience to see if there's a, there's a question over here. Yes. 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 If you could introduce yourself and your your role at, at McMaster and uh, and uh, and actually a microphone would be helpful too. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much to all the panelists for your talk. My name is Kyle. I'm a PhD candidate in chemical engineering. Um, my work deals with looking at using bacteriophages to treat uh, bacterial infections within the GI tract. Um, thank you very much for all the presentations today. You've all thought, uh, gave really thought-provoking uh, discussions. Uh, during this discussion so far, you've really talked about the underlying kind of political and communication issues regarding these types of health challenges. We saw it predominantly throughout the COVID-19 pandemic where uh, COVID-19 vaccines were politicized to a ne next level where I don't, want, I don't want to oversimplify this, but 
broadly speaking, more liberal individuals were more accepting of, of the vaccines, whereas more conservative individuals were less accepting. We also historically saw that with climate change as well, and only now have that polarization begin to diminish. And so specifically, what kind of lessons have we learned from those types of, of global challenges could we employ to prevent that kind of polarization happening with AMR? I'll say something just within the U.S. context. Um, the, uh, it, it hasn't been politicized. AMR has not been polarized yet. And, and it's, a, it's worthy to keep it from doing that. And so um, the Pastor Act, which is the, the legislative vehicle to try to do something significant on antibacterial pool incentives in the U.S., um, famously uh, is using a Noah's Ark approach to co-sponsors. They, they only let Republican and Democrats join together. Uh, so, you know, you can't have five Republicans or five Democrats. It has to be two by two, one from each party. And they've rejected opportunities to try to put the bill onto partisan bills and to only put it on, on things that are going to pass with, with large majorities. So they're making an effort on that one bill because, yes, the, uh, the downside is huge if it became, a, you know, a Democrat-Republican problem. And I think there, there is an opportunity uh, to build trust. So uh, there may be people who we would think may not have uh, appreciation for vaccines or other things. But, you know, it goes back to context. Uh, outside the U.S. as well, if you trust your local imam, your local church leader, your local tribal leader, that makes a big difference. So, so we know, for example, in... Uh, some of the First Nations or some of the indigenous communities in the U.S., the Navajo Nation rates are better than any place else in the country. They're upwards of 89%. Part of it has to do with sort of engagement with local communities to be able to do that, even though their prior rates for other vaccines actually have not been very good. So, so I think there are important lessons learned um, about uh, communications on the other side as well. So there are people who may consider themselves as um, politically progressive uh, in African-American community that have very good reasons to be skeptical of yet another government program that sort of does something to their bodies, right? So, so you really have to sort of build that trust. Uh, and I think that's uh, one of the most important lessons in moving forward here, both in communication, good communication, and, and trust with their physicians, with their public health providers, all of those kinds of things. So I would say that in, in Norway, when you go to your general practitioner, um, and uh, he or she thinks that you might need an antibiotic, the next step is you get your finger pricked and you're, you take a CRP, uh, protein analysis, to see if it's likely that you have a bacterial infection as opposed to a viral infection. You sit, you wait for 10 minutes in the waiting room, find out the result, and then you either do get an antibiotic prescription, electric, electronic prescription or not. Um, and I think that's good. The use of diagnostics is very good because the physician has something to point to to say no or yes. Um, and I, I would hope that the use of diagnostics are what will the use of science uh, determine whether or not uh, people get antibiotics as well in the hospitals, the primary care, so that we take, it, it shouldn't be a political, um, you know, I don't believe in taking this, an antibiotic, or I do. Um, I, I really don't want to see antibiotics going down the way of masks, where you see in the U.S., masks are, are very much a political kind of statement. Um, I, I want to see the science behind it. When do I need to take this, and when do I not need to take this, and, and hopefully let the science decide. And I think diagnostics have to be a part of the solution for that. And actually, just picking, picking up from Dr. Zaman's point, you know, I, I think traditionally the way we have practiced science is we just assume that knowledge will flow by osmosis, and it doesn't happen, right? So engaging with right people in the community is very, very interesting. So giving you an example of indigenous communities, engaging with elders, community elders, it's very critical because yeah, the, the, the communication from, from them is going to have really, really far-reaching consequences than any one of us in here, regardless of what we have accomplished or what we have done. So it's, it's very important. But it takes tremendous resources, and it takes tremendous patience. And we have been ignoring that. I think that's really, really, I mean, this is one thing to answer your question. This is something that we need to 
that's the take-home message. We need to really think about how we are communicating science and who we are engaging, uh, because we are not effective communicators as general uh, scientists, and so we need to enlist people who are. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah, I see several hands. One in the very back corner. Yeah, thank you for coming forward. <laughs> Thank you very much. Great symposium. Delighted to be here. I'm Nancy Doubleday. I serve as the Director of Water Without Borders Graduate Diploma between uh, McMaster University and the United Nations University Institute for Water, Environment and Health, which is located here at McMaster. I'm on research leave, which is why I can be here today enjoying this <laughs> and also looking for exciting connections, which I, I am seeing. Uh, I just wanted to share with you um, very important comments that I've picked up from all of the panelists, but I want to also feed back. So I, I'm a great believer in double and triple loop learning, and we try it out, and we, we shake it, and we see how it rolls, and we come back to the table again. Trust is, a, is, is two directions, and I think one of the things I've really learned, um, I have a long history of working for Indigenous organizations in the past, and what I've learned um, really is there's a lack of trust of Indigenous people. And it goes all over the place. Actually, Indigenous peoples already know what the solution to their problems are. It's just that we are very slow to, I think, respond appropriately in implementing. Because it is so complicated, right? It takes a whole-of-government approach to deal with it. And Canadian government's been trying whole of government approaches for about two decades. And uh, we're still working on that. So, you know, it's not an easy thing. Uh, but just to share, cut to the chase, um, here locally, Six Nations is one of our important uh, indigenous partners at McMaster. There are a lot of things going on with global water futures and so forth. Um, at Six Nations, a small group of young people called themselves the Dream Catchers, got some money, and went out and bought um, appropriate filters to put on people's taps and gave them clean water. And they've been doing this, I think, I think it's for about six months. Um, and I'm really struck because it, it kind of speaks to infrastructure, it kind of speaks to empowerment, it kind of it speaks, to, it, it, it addresses a lot of things. But for me, the big lesson is it was, it was that youth group that, that did this. And I, I kind of echo what they did. We took a group of students to Peru for Water Without Borders for their experiential learning opportunity. But we insisted on partnering with a Peruvian institute. And, and so we did. We, we partnered with uh, INAHIM, which is a, a glacial research institute which provides water for Lima and, and also monitors the glaciers in case of disaster and so forth. So the students got a really well-rounded experience, but also being mindful in many dimensions of what this would mean we included life straws, which are small personal water filter units, in the kit that we handed out to the students before they left. Um, and some of them actually found it important to have those because they were visiting Machu Picchu and swimming in a river and drinking the water from the river. Um, so again, it's this idea of low tech and trusting the users and trying to work together in a different way. And, and that's why I'm really interested in governance. So if anyone wants to talk about that, I'd be happy to. And I'm going to stop now because I am monopolizing the floor, and that's not fair. But if any of you see any value in any of the things I'm kind of inching toward, so it's the trust part, it's the humility part, it's the breaking down barriers, it's the listening, it's, it's trying to be where you are and do what you can with what you have to meet the person who's standing beside you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much for sharing those examples and those stories. Panelists, any reactions? I think uh, uh, the listening part is very, very critical. So you mentioned listening, and uh, just give an example of First Nation communities. Uh, we haven't haven't done that at all, and 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 for any solution to be to be sustainable, we have to listen listen to the community members first. Uh, as you said, they may already have solution. So, you know, I actually, uh, I think it was a couple of days ago, uh, but there was an article, I think, in Guardian saying that the sure shot way or the only way to deal with the problem of climate change is to extend the right of existence to environment, to animals, to plants. 
and First Nation communities in Canada have been practicing them for centuries. So everybody talks about two-eyed seeing, three-eyed seeing. And so it's not a novel principle, but, you know, so we can learn a lot. And so listening, listening comes uh, definitely one of the foremost things. We saw another hand there, yes. My name is Sadru. I'm a PhD student here at McMaster in Chemical Engineering. Um, I'm going to try to be beautifully tie together these last two questions. Um, you know, Kyle mentioned a little bit about how do we prevent politicization of stuff, and um, we just heard about learning from the youth. Um, so, I mean, I, I and we talked a little bit about communication uh, and how we need to work with um, science communicators. And I want to push on that a little bit, not necessarily challenge, but I mean, there's a room full of graduate students here, and I know that probably a lot of them are nerds like I for waking up at 8 a.m. to be here. Um, and we're all already on a graduate student project, some thesis-based project. So our hands are tied there, and everyone on this panel had some sort of call to action. Um, I'd like to add a small call to action really quick about how we can be that science communicator and how we should much more engage much more with our local communities. Um, and I know a lot of us will have had questions from family and friends during the pandemic about how biology works in general and how we're going to cure it. Um, but I, I, everyone on the panel brought up a little call to action, and I sort of wanted to push on that because we're not PIs, and I don't think a lot of us in this room are going to statistically become a PI. How do we continue to engage as we switch fields and, you know, still keep the narrative of AMR? Because we're going to, I mean, it's pretty easy to talk about AMR to a captured audience who already care about AMR, but how do we continue this? Um, I know uh, IP is a possible good way to be uh, involved in it, but, you know, uh, what, what are the panelists' take on continuing to be involved on top of our project and then beyond grad school? Well, Antibiotic Awareness Week is coming up next month. It's in November. And uh, I use that to talk to my friends and family about antibiotics. Because just simple messages, trying to get people to understand uh, what an antibiotic is, what you should use it for, uh, and what you shouldn't use it for. 90% um, of the antibiotics consumed in Canada come from primary care at least in humans. I'm not sure what the percentage is for animals, but probably more antibiotics are used in animals uh, in Canada than they are in, in humans. And, and just having, uh, I'm sure that Public Health Canada or Health Canada will come out with messaging regarding antibiotics. And I think you're all highly educated individuals um, and experts in biology and, and other fields and really, this is such a, it's such a great ability to basically tell your friends and family about these aspects that people are often confused about. Um, so I, I would encourage you to you know, keep up and keep doing that. And I think that probably a large percentage of you will be PI someday actually too. So I look forward to seeing your research. Talk to kids as much as you can. I know it, it takes time to go to maybe a school and, and talk to younger generation, but it's very, very critical. The other thing is you can connect with the younger generation way better than uh, we can. Um, so it's, it's very important. Uh, you know, if you're walking around in the mall with your family members, young kids, and if you see an A&W sign that says our beef is raised without antibiotic, explain it to them why, why it's critical. Why is that information critical? Um, I think it's very important uh, to talk to uh, talk to kids. One of the most uh, credible voices, um, you know, is a science person talking about this topic. Another very credible voice is a patient. Uh, you know, we, we haven't heard patient voices this morning, but um, from from my perspective, at uh, you know, I want you, all of you to understand from my perspective at Carbex is that. You know, there's been a lot of people working on, you know, reductionistic creation of a molecule or a shiny machine for therapy or prevention or diagnosis that uh, it, it satisfies all of the steps along the way, including FDA or, or Health Canada approval, but then fails when it runs into the messy thing called human society. Um, many of the antibiotic companies are, have gone bankrupt. Many of the diagnostic new devices 
uh, set unused on the shelf. There's complex reasons for that. And so, um, you know, extending your, your reach into that other piece, finding other people you can work with to make sure that um, all of the work of your labs actually ends up helping people at the end of the day, as opposed to being just a wonderful paper. Any other questions from the audience at this point? Hi, um, great talks. I had a quick question. Oh, first of all, my name is Maya. I'm a master's student at McMaster. Um, I had a quick question about, I guess, um, antibiotic resistance in terms of community outreach. So I read a paper a while ago, and it was talking about how it was a surveillance on antibiotic resistance, and sort of talking about how a lot of people figured that antibiotic resistance was a scientist issue, so that they would come up with a new drug that would cure um, resistance, and that it was necessarily a global, or I guess like a um, community issue. So considering the fact that for, um, like for example, for the COVID-19 pandemic, there is a vaccine that we can push as a preventative measure, how do we get people to sort of um, take, not take responsibility, but how do we get people to have a sense of responsibility for, in preventative ways for antibiotic resistance since the pandemic isn't really, there isn't a preventative measure that they can take like a vaccine and it's more so focusing on drugs to treat infections. I think uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is probably one of the best uh, interventions for antibiotic resistance because everybody's washing their hands. H half of you are wearing face masks. We've learned so much about infection prevention and control in the last two years that is invaluable. And this, this protects us from antibiotic resistance as well. If we practice good hand hygiene, if we you know, put on a mask when we're ill so that we don't infect others or stay home, re you know, regardless of what type of infection it is, um, these, are, these are all interventions that the world has now learned uh, through a crash course um, that will help in antibiotic resistance as well. Um, I just want to add to that that all these non-pharmaceutical interventions like infection prevention control and WASH, uh, they are broad spectrum defenses against anything. Uh, and uh, unlike a broad spectrum antibiotic, they don't have the negative externalities of, of promoting resistance or, or damaging your microbiome. I mean, these are truly excellent defenses for society. And, and we have learned how to deploy those. Your hands with something that doesn't contain triclosan or quack. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, what Dr. Zaman showed, cross resistance, so. Yes. <laughs> no, I think, I think they really captured it very well. Any other questions in the audience? Yes, in the front. Thank you all, and actually thanks to our wonderful trainees who've asked, I think, brilliant questions. Um, my name is Dawn. I'm an immunologist. I study respiratory infections, and I'm on Team Nexus. Um, one of the things that I think is really challenging in this space is working with politicians and policymakers who have a limited term and a very clear and present incentive to get reelected, and the long burning nature of this sort of thing. And certainly from my own experiences trying to engage policymakers and doing things, uh, Kyle quite wisely brought out the, you don't want it to be tethered to any political party. And so one of the things that Canada sort of experimented with it, for better or for worse, is having a chief science officer who would in theory maybe have some more longevity or who would be someone who could weather multiple governments. And that's not proved to be as strong as what we need. So I'm, I'm really curious your thoughts, and maybe the Norwegian example has some lessons to learn about how we can have people whose longevity and careers and passions and, and, and commitment to AMR will outlast our four-year electoral cycle? Well, I think one of the things is that um, the World Health Organization has encouraged every country to have a national action plan and a strategy. And, and I think that is nice because they're five-year plans. So that's longer than the, I'm not sure if it's automatically four years, but often four year cycle uh, of elections in countries, um, which should take, a, take away that uh, uh, politicization of, uh, of antibiotic resistance. But with that said, I mean, Norway, we've, we've, had, we've been lucky because we've had um, some very prominent uh, physicians 
um, that have been early and interested in antibiotic resistance that have, have really had a chance to um, convince a lot of political parties. But on the other hand, uh, right now we have a government that really wants to build a factory to produce uh, narrow spectrum penicillins and wants to stand outside and cut that ribbon. Even though the factory is not going to improve access to that antibiotic in Norway because of uh, various EU regulations. So it, it is so tempting for politicians to have some sort of, you know, big bold initiative where they can get a lot of publicity. Um, and it's, so it's very difficult uh, to get away from that. Um, so I'm not sure I have the answer because I was, you know, we've been working on this in Norway and, and trying to really trying to get longevity and based on the science and based upon a continuous strategy and, and uh, action plans, but um, we're still thinking about building a factory in Norway that probably won't have a huge amount of benefit, unfortunately. So this is a really good question. Um, so I, um, in the last several years, uh, have had the pleasure or maybe not a very pleasurable experience of working closely with two governments, the government of Pakistan and the government of Uganda. And I'll be, I'll be frank, AMR was not on the agenda. Um, I was telling this to Christine. They had to literally find where the national action plan was. Like physically, where is it? Uh, and, and, and eventually they figured it out and we weren't sure if it was the final version or the, not the one. But I mean, just to sort of uh, uh, jokes aside, it's not on the radar, right? But what works is successful examples. So people like to see themselves succeed. In some cases, that success may mean opening up and cutting a ribbon on a factory or a hospital so that you can point to the voters, look, this is what I did. Saying that I decrease antimicrobial consumption in my country doesn't buy you any votes, right? So what works is when people can point to some tangible success. And, and that's something we have to think about. What does that success look like in different contexts so that is bankable in the electoral college? That's true in the US, that's true elsewhere. Uh, saying that, look, we had less deaths than our neighbors because of COVID is success, demonstrates a commitment. Saying that we were able to start new programs that brought jobs or did something else, that we built hospitals and all of that, that's success. But oftentimes, the abstraction of the scientific questions is, is an absolute mood killer in, in, uh, in a cabinet meeting. Right, I mean, you wouldn't even, I mean, it doesn't even come on agenda, I, I kid you not. I mean, it wouldn't even be on like third page of agenda B2. Um, and the reason is because it, it has, it doesn't have the tangible aspects. And it's not that people are not smart. It's because people are very smart and want to make sure that they're able to do things that are appreciated in the public eye. So it goes back to this issue of communication, an issue of, of how do you package it. Some of it is, is, is marketing, some of it is really thinking deeply about the knock-on effects that it might have on society. And I don't think we are there yet. I honestly don't think we are there yet, but we can be. And, and that requires, again, sort of bringing scientists and epidemiologists and, and economists and lawyers together to be able to package that in a, in a given context. So, and just to make a comment to um, uh, your question, Don, uh, it, things are even more complicated in indigenous communities in Canada because the Indian Act mandates that the band council is elected every two years. So there are elections every two years. So even going back for, in our study, going back for sampling is a challenge because there's a different, different group of people there. So you have to start the process all over again. Um, I, I hope that um, the analogy of infrastructure might be helpful here in the U.S. when they're tearing up roads or building a new highway, there's a sign that says, your tax dollars at work. And, and really, they, they've made these investments boring, in a sense, by, by just building them into long-term budgets with, with you know, bonds, 40-year debt. Um, and, and so if we can make this more like infrastructure, it, there might be a path. Because I, I agree, it's, it's, not, um, it's not salient for a politician. What we do at CarbX is going to take 10 to 15 years from hit to lead to drug approval. You know, there's no politician that wants to wait, you know, that long. And yet the NIH, which, which has a 20-year horizon b before their work reaches any human, uh, you know, they, they get great support because they've sold the story of basic research will, will help you, your children, you know, or, or something.
just going to use that example that the NIH, uh, I think the appropriation this year is $45 billion. Uh, and it keeps going up because it's a political win for all parties. It's, it's, it's neutral uh, and, and it's easy just to keep throwing money at, 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 at the NIH, which is great. Um, so I think we need to think about this in terms of how does it become a political win for every yep. one uh, in order to achieve that kind of investment. There's also 165 medical schools in 50 states, all of which receive a lot of this money and tell their congressional delegations. You know, there's a political system that, that supports this whole thing, and we don't have the same system for antibiotics yet system in Canada, <laughs> for sure. Um, we may have time for one more question before I close. Yes. Hi, my name is Magda, and I'm also a graduate student here. Um, I had a question about sort of the consequences that should be implemented. So we've talked a lot about politicians and I think one angle that we haven't mentioned is how some politicians or some governments have a stake in watching certain populations or certain regions of their own country or other countries not succeed. Um, and we've seen that here at home where certain populations were strategically rather left out of the pandemic response. We've seen it outside other countries where there are stateless populations that are huge. So. Do you think that there should be any sort of consequence, whether that be monetary, whether that be social, that are implemented onto certain countries or governments that actively choose not to support certain policies or initiatives without impacting like the communities that are the most affected um, and like certain things come to mind like the WHO, their role, there's like international economic organizations, the G20, stuff like that. You're so, asking a question that's, that's very pertinent. We were having a conversation about this last night. Um, you know, there's an there's a answer of tremendous optimism and hope and there's a pragmatic one. I'll give a, uh, the, the optimism and hope one is this, they should be. The reality is that International agencies have, remember, I mean, they are run by the same countries that you may want to sanction. I mean, uh, the UN Security Council is paralyzed to do anything on Ukraine because, well, one of the countries that's a permanent member is a perpetrator. Or you can think about things in China or in Israel or wherever. It doesn't matter, right? I mean, the point is that who guards the guardians? Um, and, and that's a very hard question to answer, right? So if U.S. chooses to, let's say, or a state chooses to send people from southern border to Kevin and my backyard in Martha's Vineyard and sort of trick them and deceive them, what is the consequence? Uh, if, if, if China does something with its own population, Syria does something with its own population, it's very hard to really impose that. And if you start imposing, where does it end? Right. So, so there are these, these real questions. So I would change the question is, what's the incentive if you do it better? Uh, what's the incentive if you are much more inclusive? Some of it is brownie points, that we are in a more equitable society. And some of it could be the other way, because I'm not sure the, the stick part of this is going to work at all uh, in the current global governance, and probably has never worked, because people have their own incentive. The cared part, on the other hand, I think has more opportunity and more of a chance to for bring people on the table. This is sort of my opinion on that. Yeah, the governments of the world that are leading, you know, this AMR uh, reform are really the G7. And there's a lot of suspicion in the rest of the world about what this agenda is about. And so thinking back to climate, you know, they'll say like, well, you know, in the prior centuries, the England and the United States burned a lot of coal and set our climate afire. And now that it's the 21st century, you want us to not burn coal because your economy has already made the post-industrial transition. And, and so the same thing with antibiotics. You know, the, the West or the G7 have burned through these antibiotics and, and now we're in a trouble. And, and you want uh, Brazil or India or Pakistan to, to aggressively cons constrain use and, and whatnot. Ah, well, we see a trick. There's a lot of suspicion uh, that's, that's founded in history and colonialism and everything else. Uh, the grand bargain being offered is, uh, is that the world, this world, lacks access to the existing antibiotics we have today. 
And, and it's bad in, in high-income countries. It's infinitely worse in low-income countries. And so if there's any effort by the world to constrain utilization, to be careful with them, that must be matched with the carrot of you're going to get access to the antibiotics that, that are being produced on a timely basis at a price that you can afford uh, that, that actually impacts the health of your, of your people. Uh, otherwise, yeah, I'm not surprised at, at the suspicion or, or doubts uh, from the Global South on this agenda. But we have to be, we have to be careful because it's, it's much cheaper to give access to an antibiotic and take lots, lots of pictures and say, look, you know, we've got this, now you've got this brand new antibiotic and that's good. Everyone, everyone who needs that antibiotic should have access to it. It's more expensive to build effective sanitation and clean water systems. But those are the ones that will have the impact. And so we have to really hold our leaders to account and say, okay, okay giving uh, uh, this antibiotic is great and that's good, but the, actually everyone has to have access to clean water and sanitation. You're here. Well said. Um, I have one final sort of rapid fire question, although the question is not a rapid one to answer, but, but just go around, maybe 15 seconds each, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. But if there's one change that you could make, whether it's in policy, in regulation, in funding model, in public engagement, whatever, what would that change be that would have a really transformative impact on the field and our ability to tackle AMR? Well, you know what I'm going to say. Yeah, you know what I'm going to say. <laughs> I think I know what you're going to say. Yeah, yeah so um, the, the G7 called for rich countries of the world to pass a antibacterial pool incentive, a subscription model or other delinked payment system like what I described. Uh, England has done that. Uh, other countries are considering it. And uh, for the G7 to lead in that regard, I think, would be transformative on the antibiotic supply side of the problem. So I, I'd like to see... Uh, High-income countries pay for antibiotics differently, pay more, but also not pay for consumption, like Kevin said, uh, pay more and uh, pay for access. And I want to make sure that those antibiotics are accessible to all people who need them. And low- and middle-income countries, in exchange for that access, commit to improving uh, clean water and sanitation systems. Addressing basic hum uh, human needs, absolutely essential. Yeah, I would, I would agree with this. You have to think of antimicrobial resistance in a systems level issue, not think of it as an isolated thing, right? If you sort of focus on human dignity, access to good health care in general, affordability, and sort of awareness, I think the antimicrobial resistance part, sort of being the leader in that, will, will uplift society in general across the world. So I would say that think of it as a systems issue rather than one that is uh, a myopic only of the system. Well, thank you. you know, Jerry and, and Eric and Marie Volan told me to do this uh, today, uh, and I'm so glad they did because it's been a really wonderful experience. Thank you, Kevin, Christine, Ayush, and Mohammed. It's been really wonderful chatting with you today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.